Hi, I'm Greg Mickley. New Jersey credit unions believe that all citizens need to understand the important financial matters that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, St. Peter's University, the Jesuit University of New Jersey, United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on earth, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, New Jersey's credit unions, banking you can trust, Johnson & Johnson, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. My responsibility starts when doors to the future of a child are closed. The city, it blow deep. I know them cold streets. Motif is no peace. Can't trust the police. My mama stay out east. Hope that she good, though. She from Inglewood, so she know the hood, though. Children start claiming games as young as kindergarten. We are not going down without a fight. We can talk about what's going on. Right now, I'm trying to save Chicago. Any particularly part of Chicago? Uh, all of it. The breath of the city, no rest for the weary, no stress, it can't hear me. A fistful of fury, no dollars, no jury, a Chicago story. Place that can kill me is one that can kill me. Hard to ignore me, cause we live the loud now. Fire inside me and things that go pow out. Label me wild child, my old man don't try now. Yeah, I'm the future, but live for the now now. I want everybody around the world to look right up here. That's some good stuff. That's from Chicagoland, from uh, CNN. It's an eight-part series, and the gentleman who is uh, one of the architects of putting this together is with us. Once again, he is uh, Mark Levin, the executive producer of Chicagoland. Great stuff there. Thank Great you, stuff. Steve. Congratulations. Good to see you again. Uh, you joined us last time. Brick City? That's right. Uh, about Newark? That's right. Um, what gave you the idea for this? Well, Brick City... Got a lot of great feedback. We won a Peabody, nominated for an Emmy. And uh, at one point, we uh, were sitting down with Laura Michael Chesson, who was the executive at the Sundance Network, and Bob Redford. And we all oh, looked at Robert each other. Oh, Robert Redford? Yeah, I saw Redford. him introduce the show on CNN. I'm like, That's right. hey, Levitt's work with Robert Redford. Not bad. That's right. Now, <laughs> uh, he's a great guy. And uh, we said, uh, he said something like, you know, well, if we were going to pick another city, you know, where do you think we should go? And we kind of all looked around, and it was almost like a simultaneously a harmonic convergence. Chicago. Chicago, yeah. first family from Chicago. Obviously, a lot of the issues that every metropolitan area is dealing with, Chicago is dealing with. Rahm Emanuel, one of the most, uh, you know, compelling political faces on the, on the scene, was That's mayor. Right. Um, so we said, uh, let's see who's interested in CNN. Jeff Zucker had just taken over, and they were looking for a new direction. So it all came together very quickly. Great stuff. Now, the characters, um, Gary McCarthy, who is the head of the police department out there, we knew from Newark and before that, and right here in New York City. Um, tough, fascinating, brilliant guy. And also, Elizabeth Dozier is a school principal. Describe her, because people are going to get to know her because she's important. She's powerful and a great educator. Elizabeth Dozier is the principal of Fenger High School, Christian Fenger Academy, uh, which sadly became famous five years ago where, when a young man, Darian Albert, was killed going home uh, in a, a street brawl and somebody with a cell phone videotaped it as he was being beaten down and it went all around the world. Elizabeth <clears throat> Dozier had taken over that school literally 10 days earlier. Uh, so she started in the middle of really chaos uh, and in five years has turned that school around uh, remarkably. Uh, so 
that was kind of the beginning of the story, but uh, she got a federal grant, which helped make sure. that happen, you know, with special programs and what they call restorative justice. And visiting and, parents and getting them more engaged and involved in schools and their kids' education. Exactly. And those programs matter. And sadly, that grant was running out at the end of last spring. So that became part of the story also. Not only how does someone turn a school around like this, but what do you do when you lose the funding for those special programs? The other thing is that uh, early on in the series, uh, Rahm Emanuel is trying to uh, reduce the number of public schools because there are not enough uh, public school students to support the number of public schools right. in Chicago. And so they're, they're reducing schools. The problem is when you reduce the schools, that means those children have to go to other schools further away. The problem with that is that these children and their parents are deathly afraid of walking past certain gang zones, borders, if you will, and what that means because the gang wars and the gang activity in Chicago is so out of control. Let's take a look at Chicagoland talking about that problem. We'll come back to Mark. Let's go to the clip. The mayor's taking a risk with his bold school plan. While it might make sense because of the budget crisis and declining enrollment, many parents fear it puts their kids at risk because they'll have to walk across dangerous gang lines to attend new schools. Mom and Manuel think he can just come into our schools and move all our kids all over gang lines and just say, oh, we can build a building right here. Let's take this school out. We don't care about these kids, but it's kids in there. They need safety. Sean's speaking out for the 30,000 kids who would be affected by school closings. You should be investing in these schools, not closing them. You should be supporting these schools, not closing them. We are not toys. We are not going down without a fight. Where's this kid come from? <laughs> Uh, Sean, uh, we met him, uh, Sean Johnson, uh, at, at a, I think he's nine years old, uh, at this rally, and we were so amazed. He was so eloquent, so articulate. Uh, we asked him, his mother whether we could follow him. You'll see him in the second episode, which is on tomorrow night. Right. Uh, and the thing about this series is it's done, it's about all the issues we're dealing with in every major city, not right. just Chicago. But it's told in more of what we would call a narrative nonfiction form, meaning it's characters like Ashan, like Elizabeth Dozier, we follow, like you would in a scripted series, so that you become involved in their stories. You see kind of the issues through their eyes, and hopefully you become vested enough that you say, oh, I need to find out what's going to happen next to Fenger High, or what's going to happen to Ashan's school. Is it going to stay open or closed? But here's the thing. Rahm Emanuel, making tough decisions. A lot of people angry, some of them calling him a racist, some of them calling him a murderer. He doesn't care. He said, I'm doing it for these kids. I have to do what is right. There's some, there's a story like this, have to have, have, to have a villain, and has Rahm Emanuel become the villain? And, is that, and that's the part that, frankly, on some level started bothering me, because I'm thinking, he's being a leader, he's doing what he thinks he's right, is right. Whether he's right or wrong, or people agree or disagree with him, he's become the villain. Well, I, you got this little cute kid, third grader, <laughs> right. who's gonna argue with that kid? What? Well, what I would say, Steve, is you gotta, you know, stay with the whole series, as you know, as we do the, we, as we do this program, I've only seen the first one, I'm gonna watch every one on CNN. Because, you know, as in any story, your characters develop, they arc. rise, they fall, exactly, the, the, the arc. So uh, th these first two episodes really build to the fifth episode, which is when school opens. Don't give anything away. And I would say we went there with uh, an attitude was not to deify or crucify the mayor or the city. It was really to chronicle, given that, that um, Rahm Emanuel has a reputation as a politician who makes things happen. That's right. Who gets results. Right. So you want to go to a place where where the, all the problems that New York, L.A., Newark, we're all right. dealing with. But, okay, here's a guy that makes things happen. Let's see how he deals with this. Now, even the school closings, which are happening all over the country, he saw that there were 100,000 less students in the school population, and he decided to take the most radical school consolidation plan in, in the, the country. country. So on one <clears throat> hand, you can give him credit. On the other hand, there are going to be critics like the young man you just saw who said, wait a and second. And the school teachers union. Teachers Union. Absolutely. That has been his greatest foe because there was a strike before we landed, um, right. pr really the largest uh, teacher strike in 25 years. Look, first of all, Chicago's uh, a city like our city that people aren't afraid to express their opinions. It's famous for in-your-face politics. 
Uh, and second, we're dealing with these massive issues where we see on a national level, state level, we're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So it is in cities where things happen, uh, which is what, again, attracted us there. Um, but you don't have a point of view. You and your colleagues do not have a point of view on any of this. Our point of view is let's find characters who are making a difference, who are leaders, like you said. But who they're are not willing... characters. They're real... You keep calling them characters. They're real people. They are is real... that semantics? That is semantics, yes. They're real. Let's find real people who are on the front line of making a difference in people's because lives. Because Gary McCarthy, okay. the head of the police there, again, we knew Gary from Newark. That's right. People in New York City, you may have remembered Gary from here. Mm -hmm. Gary's not being anything other than what he was in Newark and was in New York City. Well, Gary... That's the kind of cop he was and is. He's not being a character. Gary is one of the rare people who says, I don't care if a camera is around me 24 hours because I always act the way I am, who I am. He is truly transparent, and I give him tremendous credit. Uh, he also went to a city that has a history of gang culture like no other city, including New York and L.A. Uh, and it's fascinating to see we really chronicled the great turn in reducing homicides, reducing shootings in this period from the spring to the fall. And this year, the city of Chicago finished 100 less homicides, which is quite significant. But the anyway. gang activity remains a massive problem. Massive. And the gun problem. We know that Gary, one of the crusades he is on, is for a similar law in Illinois like we right. have here in New York, which is mandatory minimum for illegal gun possession. The series is called Chicagoland. It is on CNN. The executive producer is Mark Levin. And I want to thank you for joining us. And we continue to be fascinated by uh, the work that you are doing together with your colleagues. And we congratulate you on a great accomplishment. Appreciate it, Steve. Good thank stuff. You. Thank you. Stay right there. This is WNET's uh, Tish Studio, and that's why we bring great people like you in, so we can do stuff like this. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program, or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. There she is, Delia Efron, who is the author of Sister, Mother, Husband, Dog. What, by the way, could you set up the title? <laughs> it's my major food groups. <laughs> <laughs> Explain it. Well, you know, actually, the book started with sister. I mean, my sister and Nora yes. and I were very, 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 very close. And, How close? And why? Well, I was three years younger, and from the day I was born, she bossed me around. <laughs> My first memory is of her biting in, into a tomato in such a perfect way as to squirt juice in my eye. <laughs> um, and our parents were screenwriters. And they really raised writers. They wanted to raise writers. And uh, there were four daughters. And Nora knew she would be a writer from the day she was born. And I didn't. But she had the I, gift? Yeah. It was, I think it's genetic because all four sisters became writers. But... Um, we became collaborators. We were not only very close as children, but then we collaborated on movies and we wrote movies together that she directed. So you got I, mail. Yeah, Michael. Um, this is my life. Um, we we did a lot of work together, right. and and our parents were screenwriters. So it was just really kind of weird and strange that we ended up collaborators. So I just never expected to be without her, and I was like, I was like living in a city with no street signs. And every day I would go into my office and I just started to write about our sisterhood and what it means to be a sister. I think, do you have sisters? I have two sisters. Oh, okay, one well, one younger. sisters between them, I mean, the sisterhood is uncivilized. Uncivilized. I mean, civilized. Oh, completely. There, there's just some way that you will treat a sibling that you would never <laughs> dream of treating a friend. And in fact, as you get older, I think, if you, if you have sisters and you love them, you, you have great friends who are better versions of your sisters in some way that you get along with perfectly. But no, you're hard on them in a way that you never would be. And it's a very unique relationship. And it must be true, I think in all families, everybody's harder on each other than they are on their friends. And anyway, I tried to sort of get at what it was, what our sisterhood was about and what it meant to me to lose her. And... Well, 
we were sort of fused, I think. I mean, she used to say we shared half a brain. And that was why we could write together. And I didn't really make, and, and when we worked together, she was very tough. Did you ever have her on the show? Did you ever no. interview her? Okay. She knew the power of silence. You know, just nothing intimidates like silence. There isn't much of it That's on true. television, but nothing intimidates like silence. And I was, of course, the sister everyone could get along with. So people would just fall on me with all their complaints and that they didn't have the nerve to tell her. So we were kind of, the work was so, we were such a perfect match, the older sister and the middle sister, that um, it just, and then we shopped together and we ate together and it was just very but close. So that, that's, that started you writing this, but then you write about your mom. I did write about my mom, um, my mother, who was rather remarkable. And my parents wrote like, they wrote Daddy Long Legs, No Business Like Show Business, Death Set. They wrote some wonderful movies that you see on like Turner Classics. And uh, when I was 11, this kind of amazing mother I had who really was the force in the family and the reason all her daughters became writers, uh, became a terrible alcoholic. And I mean it. I think of it as just happening when I was 11, that it turned. And when I wrote this book, one of the things I wanted to write about was, to my sister Nora, my mother said, she said, take notes. And to me, she said, I hope you never tell anyone what happens here. Oh, boy. She, she, she so, didn't want you talking about this? What? Did she, do you think she did not want you talking about I think your that alcoholics together. want you to keep the secret, and it's not your job as a child to keep the secret. It's their job to take care of you, not your job to take care of them. Is, and is, when you get older, I think you may never get past it if you keep that secret. Is there any part of you that feels that you broke some sort of unwritten code? Oh, I certainly, I, I certainly did in the sense that she did not want to be known in this way, yes. But you felt you needed to. Yes, because what happens when you have anyone who has addiction in their family in any way, parents, mm. you, especially if you're a child, you are become a watcher. You always look to see what's going to happen, and maybe you have a move to make it not happen, right. which is in my family, I think of it as a day mother and a night mother because at night she was so terrifying to me and raging, angry, and in the day, this elegant, wonderful woman. And I, I really feel that no siblings have the same parent, that you're born into a family at a different time and your parents That's relate so differently. True. It's so, so true. People I don't really, like to say that, but it's true. No, it is. And I it was telling it's not, it's my story. Yeah, yeah. And I oh, think, we treat everyone the same. That's BS. I think they want to in their dreams. Sure. But they, <laughs> right. And, and it's a noble want, you know, but it isn't, it isn't happening. <sighs> You know, it's, it's a, I wanted to get it all that when I wrote the book. How cathartic for you? It was, actually. I even wrote about how I blew my 20s completely, which I know you have no sympathy for, because I you think mean? you were, weren't you like this totally pulled together person in your 20s? Get out of here. Oh, I thought you were. I read a little bit about you, and I thought, I, oh, I he did doesn't know. That, <laughs> yeah, I, I did some things that, yeah, well, whatever. Whatever. Yes. Um, <laughs> so... So here's the thing. Google, don't, don't, Google is overrated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when you say, so you're involved in stuff that you wish you hadn't, but didn't that, doesn't, it sounds corny, no, but doesn't happened, that make you how great you are today? No, what happened was I didn't have the nerve to be a writer. And when I was 10, I saw a movie called Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I don't know. No. It, oh, okay. Well, it's like. Short version. Go ahead. The short version is that I wanted to grow up as a result and marry a wild man and move to the backwoods and make flapjacks. <laughs> That's the short version, okay? And you took so, away what? What message? That, exactly. <laughs> and there's my mother saying, have a career, have a career, be a writer. And all I do is get married and move, not to the backwoods, but Rhode Island. And about, I don't know what I was doing there. You know, and this happens in your 20s. And once I started writing about Nora, I just started writing about how a movie can change your life. A wow. movie that you see when you're young, it gets into your heart and your head in a way that nothing else wow. does. Um, the name of the book is Sister, Mother, Husband, Dog by Delia Efron. And um, I, I don't like when people say this, you know, what's the message of the book? Read it and take whatever message you choose to take away from it, like you took a powerful message away from that movie. 
And uh, Dee, I want to thank you for joining us. We thank appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. Okay. Yes. You live right in the neighborhood, don't you? Downtown. See? Yeah. The same thing. <laughs> Stay with us right back right after this from the Tisch WNET studio. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dave Itzkoff is the author of Mad as Hell, The Making of Network, and The Fateful Vision of the Angriest Man in the Movies. Good to see you, Dave. Thank you for having me on. This is all about the movie Network, which was made in what year? 1976. The and year I was born. 1976. We were born the same year. Oh, good. Okay. That's wild. Excellent. Stop, <laughs> hey, stop laughing, crew. Leave it alone. Um, so Network, set it up for us. Howard Beale is? So he is the insane or going insane anchorman of a fourth place television network called UBS. All right. uh, and the crazier he goes, he sort of sets up this, uh, this face-off between an old-school news uh, director, uh, a character called Max Schumacher, played by William Holden, and a sort of new breed of programming executives, uh, one of whom is played by Faye Dunaway. And it's sort of a fight over, you know, whether this crazy man should stay on the air. And in the meantime, uh, this crazy person is having a tremendous influence over the millions of TV viewers. But he's really crazy. And then they give Howard Beale a television show. Right? It would not happen on PBS. <laughs> so he gets a television show, and he's increasingly getting, you know. And then all of a sudden, he says to everyone, I want you to go to your window. I want you to open up your window. And I want you to yell as loud as you can. Right. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. And really loud. Oh, yeah. And now people, you see the scene where people are doing that, and you realize they've given a show to this guy. Right. Well, the audience is understanding it on kind of two levels. I mean, there is this kind of truth in Howard Beale's insanity. I mean, this is, you know, the movie's coming out in an era of sort of national frustration. America is still a very pent up and frustrated country. So this is a, a, a line and a speech that still resonates with us. But the audience of the movie knows, wait a minute, it's also being performed and recited by a character that lost his mind 10 minutes ago. So, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of turning over our airwaves to uh, irresponsible and potential Actually insane people. What's interesting is a few years later, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure how many years later, I was working at another network, uh, Channel 9. Sure. Right? Sure. Remember okay. the guy, you know the guy I'm going to talk about? Yeah, Morton Downey. I was in a newsroom and he was in another studio, uh -huh. Morton Downey Jr., right? Yep. It was, sim it was kind of similar. I'm not saying Morton Downey was, you know, certifiable. <laughs> but there was a lot of screaming and yelling. There was a lot of physical, you know, oh, craziness, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Was it, did it remind you of that? Oh, sure. I mean, I remember that era very vividly. I mean, that was really, you know, it was all about sort of tapping into an audience's emotion and getting them riled up and, you know, making sure that they were with you and on the same page about things. I mean, it, you know, we went very quickly from this era of, you know, Walter Cronkite as the sort of, you know, dispassionate, uh, you know, uh, you know, he was like the dean of the anchors, right. you know, and it was only in those rare occasions when he expressed emotion about, you know. Particularly when Kennedy was killed. Exactly. Or, or you know, uh, you know, his offense at the Vietnam War, things like that. Those were very rare moments. Otherwise, he was supposed to be but playing. But subtle it. emotion. Right. And, and da playing it down the middle. And then we lost that all. The message in the book with respect to the impact that the movie network had on actually kind of setting the tone for what ultimately has wound up in some venues in the TV news or the television business overall. Oh, sure. I mean, it's deeply prophetic in terms of predicting, I mean, not only what was going to happen to news and that news itself was going to have to become entertainment and become profitable in the same way that, you know, dramas and sitcoms are, but, I mean, it also just anticipated, you know, I mean, it, it, think about it being made in an era of only three broadcast networks. There was no cable TV, no internet, and it's just as applicable now that I mean, the more mass media that we have and the more sort of avenues to express ourselves and get information that we have, I mean, the more divided we become and the more disconnected we become, not only from authentic information, but even from each other. And that's what the movie was really warning about, is that media is supposed to be something that connects us, and actually it can be something that really drives you inward into yourself and makes you only look for opinions and voices that directly reflect how you already feel. So it's so interesting. Uh, we've had people in the last two days that we've been taping here at uh, the Tisch WNET studio, Lincoln Center. We've had folks from CNN, MSNBC, and the Fox News Channel. Right. All right? Okay. And what's so fascinating about it is that, let's just say at MSNBC and um, 
and 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 uh, and and MSNBC and Fox, mm. they have audiences that are pretty loyal to them, and a fair number of folks who watch them are watching and listening to people who express points of view that are consistent with their point of view. Is that a relatively fair statement? I think that's fair, sure. But I, I mean, I think that this is, these are things that, you know, it's even absent cable news. I mean, these were, these were things that were set in motion even in the, 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 the network era. I mean, you think era. so? Oh, sure. I mean, look at what happened to CBS in the 1980s. I mean, that when they got bought up by, uh, oh, uh, I probably shouldn't say because their name is on this building, but, uh, you know, when... The <laughs> yeah, leave that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was a period, let's say, in the 1980s where CBS had a major blow Bloodletting when they really had to say, okay, you know, but, our but news operation can't lose money anymore. But hold on. That is not the same as, mm -hmm. and I'm not here to defend the folks who are connected to, to us at public television, right. but at the same time, that is not the same as having a cable network that has a point of view and has people on that network that support that point of view and has an effort to bring in an audience that supports that point of view, and frankly, doesn't do a whole lot to bring in information that contradicts that point of oh, view. Absolutely. That's a whole different thing. I mean, thing. That's, that, is, that is a much further evolution of that idea. But, that but was, did it get kicked that, off that was back in network? That was because of, right, I mean, that was, right, it, that was anticipating a period. I mean, it was supposed to be this kind of far-flung future in the movie, this, this world that could never really be and people didn't believe could happen. But once you drop that sort of fig leaf that, you know what I mean, news, news is supposed to be separate from entertainment when you had nobody defending news from having to be entertaining and profitable, then right. that's what it was going to turn into, and we see what happened. Do you think the creators of Network realized that while they were doing something that, oh, come on, this is Howard Beale. There'd never be a Howard Beale. Let's, let's just do this. It'd be entertaining and fun. Do you think on some level, some of them really thought, hey, wait a minute, we are potentially predicting the future. Oh, I mean, the, the, the movie itself is really the emanation of a, of a single person. I mean, not to discredit anybody else who, you know, was also and deeply was involved, it? but that's Patty Chayefsky. And, I mean, here's somebody who was, you know, deeply pessimistic about not only our future, but just about human nature in general, that whenever we're presented with choices, we're always going to take the path of least resistance. And, you know, that's how he got things right. Yeah, Patty Chayefsky was doing that a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny to think of him. I mean, here's the guy who starts off as the author of things like Marty, which is, you know, Oh, what a great... 1957 yeah. won the Academy Award? Right, for Best Picture and also Ernest for Best Borg Night. Night. That's right, right, all of the above. And, I mean, that's a very sort of simple but beautiful character piece. I mean, that's not a story about, you know, the negative side of humanity. But, you know, the more successful Chayefsky got and the wider approach he had... Mad as hell. <laughs> Dave Iskoff, go out and get it. Thank you. Way back then, 1976, but they got it right. Thank you, yeah. Dave. Certainly. Thanks for having me on. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health. St. Peter's University, United Water, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey's Credit Unions, Johnson & Johnson, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.